Hello and welcome my partners in crime and thank you for joining me again today. So before I start I just want to say I'm, I am trying out some new um, editing um, parts on this um, video. So like this is the subscribe button should drop down. There's some things that should happen on this video. Let's hope they do. So if there's any mistakes in, it, in the editing I'm sorry but I am trying new stuff to make it uh, a little bit more interesting. Actually, I'm also going to add some clips and stuff from uh, about this case to this um, video. So hopefully it all goes well. Must just also say thank you to my lovely partners in crime from my members lounge. Um, and as you can see, you know, Star of Month stuff is up there. And um, you can see advertisements and stuff on there. So thank you to them and you'll see their names come up on the slide for that. Okay. Enough about the housework and stuff. Let's get on now to this case. This case is uh, a 1970s case. It's in Australia, in Wollongong in Australia. Um, the girl that went missing is an English child. She was three year old at the time of her disappearance. There are twists and turns in this case. This case may be a 1970s disappearance of a child case. case. The police presume abduction and abduction and murder of this child, uh, Cheryl Grimmer. But there's more to this case than that. This case continues to be in the news right up until today. And as we go through this case, you can see why. So this case is classified as as unsolved. Uh, and I'm. <laughs> You know, but until someone is charged, you know, prosecuted and um, put in prison and has been proven by without reasonable doubt that this, he murdered this child, you know, abducted and murdered this child, this case must still remain unsolved. So this is the terrible case, really, the very upsetting case of little Cheryl Grimmer was three year old at the time of her abduction um, from um, a Wollongong beach in Australia in 1970. So let's sort of let me give you sort of an outline of this case. So for Cheryl Grimmer's family, it's including her mum, her dad, her brothers, um, it should have been a new start in Australia for them. I think they'd moved about you know, not long before, I think about 18 months, two years before her disappearance, um, they'd moved from the UK to um, Australia. Her parents were Carol and Vincent, and her brothers were Ricky, Stephen and Paul, and their home was in Bristol um, in the UK, and then they moved, you know, like many people did in the 60s and the 70s to Australia. Um, and it, it was really meant to be a new start for this family. But less than two years later, Cheryl, just age three at the time, mysteriously disappeared. She had body, she's just vanished really from this beach and uh, her body has never been found since. Her family, listen, they were just on this straight away. They've never give up. They really have never ever give up. And um, to find out what happened to her. Um, but I think as we now come up in the years, and where things have happened throughout this case. Um, it's probably now um, over. The fight is probably over. And, and it's quite upsetting really, because I talk about the law and, and stuff, and the law is in this. And the law, I mean, we can either agree with it or we can not agree with it. But if we don't agree with it, and, um, and I think as we go through this case, there's other cases that I think, and even in this country, that when we talk about people that come in and give confessions to a murder, and they are young, and they are unaccompanied, there's no appropriate adult, they haven't got any family members with them, the reliance on that um, confession, should it be taken seriously, or if it was taken seriously and they couldn't find any evidence to back it up, and then many years later they go back for this person then to try and say, no, you did murder this girl. Because of further investigations in the end, the judge 
literally has said it was inadmissible in court. So there's lots of issues with this case when it comes to legal issues. But did someone here get away with murder? That's really the question that I need you to think of when we go through this case. You know, we can't say this man is guilty because really he hasn't been charged and it hasn't been proven that without a reasonable doubt that he did this crime. So, you know, as far as the law is concerned, this man is a free man to wander the streets. Now that's whether he killed little Cheryl Grimmer or not. Now this is the police think he did, the family think he did, everyone thinks he did, but they can't get him into court to prove it. So really, you know, 50 odd years fight to get justice for Cheryl Grimmer. Do I think they're ever going to get it? Unless something new comes up and we'll talk about that as we go through this case. Probably not. Okay, so let's look at this case. So back in 19, uh, 1968, this Grimmer family, you know, they were embarking on this new adventure of their life. They were about to leave England and for this, you know, to go to the other side of the world to take their children and have this great new life. And their expectations must have been so high. Because myself, I've lived in Australia, I've emigrated to Australia and I took my children there and, and it's an amazing place. So I can understand how these people must have been feeling. You usually leave a different, and move to different countries and emigrate because you want to do it for the better, to better your lifestyle, to better your children. And I can, so I can really understand where these people were coming from. Now in them days they would have got the boat over, when you know the big ships over and they would have had about six weeks sailing, um, over six to eight weeks going across the oceans towards Australia, you know, it must have been an adventure of a lifetime for all of them, really. So they finally, they've got then to Australia and they've settled in and they um, have been living there for, you know, and I think the father, he was um, in the Australian Army, he joined the Australian Army, he was in the Australian Army. So on the 12th of January, 1970, the dad was at work, Vince, Vince was at work, um, and he was serving in the Australian Army, as I've said at the time. And they'd had a lovely few hours on the beach, these kids, including Cheryl, and her brothers, and the mum, sitting there chilling. Now, this was the 12th of January. Now, in Australia, in England today, I'm sitting here, and in January, there's no way you go to the beach, but in Australia, you know, this was really, you know, the summer. This is hot. Now, this is Wollongong. This is just a few hours from Sydney. So this, this is now hot, a hot day. They're on the beach and at about 1.30 p.m. the mum decides, right, that's it, it's time now to go back, you know, and they've been living in a hostel um, not far from there, um, which you used to get years ago when you used to emigrate to Australia. You'd go into one of the government hostels and they'd look after you for a couple of years until you set yourself up. And this is where they were staying, very close now to this beach. This is where they were staying. And as you can see by when I put up the slide of this beach, um, there wasn't much there in them days. It's probably a lot different today. There certainly wasn't any telephones. There wasn't anything like that. So in about, about 1.30 p.m., the family decide that sits. And the mum says to the uh, oldest child, and he was seven at the time, and we'll go into him a little bit more. Okay, it's time to head home. You know, let's get ourselves cleaned up and let's, let's go. So as the mum's packing up, and you've got the shower blocks just over there, the mum's packing up all the stuff, and the four kids, um, you know, these brothers, and with um, Cheryl, go to the shower block. Uh, and also there was a drinking tap up there as well for fresh water. So I think they need some water, you know, playing in the sun, it's a hot day, covered in sand, you're off to the showers, clean yourself up before you go home. That's what was going on at that point. Now, minutes later though, minutes later, and I'm talking about minutes, about two minutes I think, the whole world for this family changed. Gerald was big brother Ricky, who was seven at the time, seven years old, went to tell the mother that the sister, 
Cheryl would not come out of the toilets. You know, typical three-year-old tantrums. I'm not going, I'm not going. She was messing around in there. So we think. Because Ricky, seven-year-old, was a little bit embarrassed to go into the girls' toilets. They'd gone into the boys, she'd gone into the girls. So he was a little bit embarrassed, embarrassed about going in and getting Cheryl out because she was being a little bugger. She's like, I'm not coming out. Um, and so he thought, oh. So what he did, he ran over to where his mother was on the beach and said, Cheryl won't come out of the toilets. Now, by the time they got back to them toilets, Cheryl Grimmer was gone. And that's really it. That is really it. But it wasn't really for these poor kids and this Ricky who had you know, a seven-year-old that's continued to have guilt over this for years. So by this time, Carol would come back. You know, she'd run up to the, to the changing rooms, to the shower rooms, uh, literally minutes, and I mean minutes, to get her daughter and then to head home. But listen, she weren't there. So they've searched the beach, they're thinking, okay, you've gone, been gone a couple of minutes, literally you could see where the, cha where the shower rooms were and the beach. And it was literally, he ran over, got his mum, they've gone back, she's gone, without trace. That's it. So I think, listen, as I said before, there's no phones on the beach. They're now thinking, has she come out of these um, changing rooms, these shower rooms, and um, gone over to the beach? She could have. She could have. Has she wandered off? Has she come out and wandered off? Now they're looking for a missing girl. Listen, their nightmare had just started, and the nightmare has lasted over 50 years. This child's body has still never been found. And poor Ricky. It's a real um, terrible for this lad. Because this lad, the seven-year-old, was the boy that said to his mother that day, sort of hounded her, you know, I want to go to the beach, mum, I want to go to the beach, mum, it's a hot day. You know, these kids, you know what kids are like at seven? I've had, well, actually, I've got a son called Ricky. Um, and in Australia it was the same, you know, you want to take your kids to the beach, they want to go to the beach, they're hounding you, you've got other things to do, but you think, know, okay, let's have a couple of hours on the beach. So this is what he's done. Then he's took this child to the changing rooms, he's left her at the changing rooms because she won't come out of the toilet. Remember this lad is seven, he's seven years old, he's run back to the mum and then by the time they've got this child's gone. This boy has had guilt the whole of his life for this, what's happened. And as I always say with these crimes, it's not only the victim that goes missing that's affected by these crimes. It's the entire family, what I call the secondary victims in this, the people that are left. This boy was seven years old and has been walking around with guilt, one, for wanting to go to the beach, two, for leaving his sister for a very short while, while he went to get his mum because the sister wasn't behaving. The child was seven year old himself. And he says it himself, he cannot get over it. He cannot get over the guilt. And there's more about Ricky that we're gonna talk about later on in the case. And I really feel sorry for Ricky. And I don't think any of this, any of this, Ricky should feel guilty about at all. At all. He really shouldn't. Now the beach that Cheryl disappeared from was this uh, fairy meadow beach. Now it's in Wollongong and it's a couple of hours from um, Sydney. Um, and as I said, there's no, I mean this, this woman's now, the mother Carol, has had to leave the beach without her child because there's no way of contacting the police or anyone else in them days, you know, no mobile phones, no nothing. She's had to go now, away from this beach, to contact the police to get people to help her search for this child. This woman must have been frantic. Now, as they started to investigate this crime and search for Cheryl, 
There was um, a witness report at the time who claimed to have seen a man holding Cheryl, wrapped up in a towel um, and up at the drinking water of the fountain um, and then the person ran off with her. That's what they saw. There was also claims that she had been driven off in a white car. So the police followed up every lead, like they had three main suspects in this. And of course they would have been known sex offenders at that time by the police because this was their three main suspects. But none of them could be uh, positively identified by any of the witnesses at the time either um, on the beach at that time. So there was very, very few, um, anything really, witnesses or evidence around at this time in this case there really wasn't and I think it was really um, a very difficult case this right from the minute this child disappeared now at this point a year later after Cheryl's disappearance is where things start to get interested in this case so just uh, just after a year after the little girl vanished this three-year-old vanished a local teenager confessed to the killing now, due to his age, the boy was never identified, but became known as Mercy. Don't know why. The police interviewed um, in the early 1970s. He reported confessing to the killing and had intended to have sexual intercourse, this is what he's saying, with her before carrying out the murder. Now, this is what he said has happened. Now, despite this, officers did not have enough evidence to charge this youth and this case then was closed. Now this was in the 70s. Right, so I, this, you know, let's go right back now. This is what they're saying. We've had a confession and okay, you've had a confession from a lad who's walked in, a young teenager, who's walked in and told you that he has murdered and he, he abducted this child because he wanted sexual intercourse with this child and then he went on to do that before he murdered her and um, they couldn't find any evidence. Now, I've often said that you do have people that will come in and confess to a crime that they have not done because they want to be noticed and, and stuff. There's, there's big issues with it actually. Now maybe the police at this time thought that was what happened here. Because don't forget, Cheryl's body's never been found. He couldn't give, or he didn't at the time, or did they ask? Did he know where the location of her body was? Maybe the evidence wasn't there in that way. Because really, if you could have found this child within that year or just after a year, the um, forensic evidence even now could have been used to really find out if there was more than one perpetrator in this crime or if he actually really did it. You know, you, you just don't know. But for some reason, they didn't really believe him or they couldn't find enough evidence to make this charge stick. And so he walked free. So, okay, early 1970s, the case, the case was closed. I mean, <laughs> uh, okay, I think, I, I wouldn't have said they should have closed the case. It should have been an open case, always. When you close a case, that means there's no investigation continuing to go on. Now, you may not have had enough evidence on this person, on this perpetrator, um, who has confessed to a crime then but once you close that case that means there is no other investigation it wouldn't continually go on it wouldn't be looked at this sort of thing anyway um, I don't think the family were very happy about this and don't forget this family has had to go through years now of not knowing where this child is they know about the confession from this young lad um, that said that this child had been raped you know abducted and murdered um, and um, buried somewhere and they haven't found their child but the police in New South Wales in this Wollongong area have now closed this case and that's it because they can't find any evidence okay so now we lead on to um, 2016 so this is what now makes this case relevant so the family now don't forget by this stage I think the mum and dad have both now passed away now you've got the three brothers now, especially Ricky, now fighting continuously for the police to open up or start investigating or doing something about the disappearance 
of Cheryl Grimmer, his sister. And I think in 2016, a man again was arrested and charged the following year. Our reinvestigation into the 1970 murder of Cheryl Grimmer. Uh, detectives from Wollongong Local Area Command attended Victoria yesterday. They were armed with an arrest warrant. Um, they took a 63-year-old male into custody. He was interviewed down there. He went before the court at Frankston yesterday. Um, extradition has been granted and he'll return this afternoon to Wollongong. And I can tell you that he'll face Wollongong Local Court tomorrow morning. Uh, the breakthrough was that we've had a number of persons of interest. Okay, He, the fellow we've got in custody, is a, was a person of interest. We centred our investigations around him and as a result we've gathered information, we've corroborated certain information and um, statements back in the original investigation and it's led us to the arrest. He's going to be charged with detained for advantage and murder. Now the man was uh, now 65. He pleaded not guilty to Cheryl's murder in September of that year and he had been due to stand trial put in an end to this 50 year plus um, mystery of this missing child of Cheryl Grimmer. So you can imagine, can't you? You know, they think, yes, finally. Now it turns out that the man they arrested, who was then 65 in 2006, uh, 2016, was the youth, the teenager from the 1970s, 1971, when he came in and, and done his voluntary, um, you know, he admitted voluntary that he had, um, what he had done to Cheryl Grimmer. So this is the same person now in 19, 2016, he'd been re-arrested a year later. It's all going to call everything, look hunky-dory, the family are like, great, we're going to get justice now. And then the court said, no. Because the interview from the 70s was deemed inadmissible. Now it was deemed inadmissible because at the time the teenager had gone into the police station and had been spoken to, interviewed. Um, I think he was cautioned and everything else, but he didn't have an appropriate adult or a, an adult with him. Now at that time, um, there was sort of no rules like as what they are now to where you have to have appropriate adult, but because them rules are now in place in the criminal system, especially in Australia and in every country where you cannot take a child and, and, and um, interview a child in any way, um, whether that's a child or whether they're deemed to be, um, you have learning difficulties or anything else, if they need an appropriate adult or a parent, that's what they need. And now if you don't do that, that means the process of law, I mean in this case, in, in this country, it would be pace that you're breaching. Um, then that evidence or anything that person said in that interview is non-admissible in court. That means that case is now over because I think their only reliance on this um, to get the guilty charge on this man was the reliance on this interview from the 70s. And the minute that became inadmissible in court, the case was over, that was it. Another, again, this case fell apart, the family are left now with nothing. And I've, I've said before, haven't I, you know, when we um, look at some of these old cases and actually when we look at some of these new cases where you have technicalities that have allowed people to walk free, because this lad didn't have a, you know, a proper adult, a parent or a lawyer present, even if the judge said, okay, in them days, you know, didn't matter, it's not the rules as it is today, we'll let it go through, this court would have never, this case, would have never succeeded in court. It would have always been thrown out because the boy at that age um, wouldn't have known. He could have been a boy that was just confessing to a murder that he knew nothing about. The police should have got him at least a lawyer. If they didn't have an appropriate adult or they didn't have a parent, a lawyer should have been present there before you start speaking to anybody and this is even now where a lot of these cases fall apart because of the process and this is what's happened to this case 
So whether this case um, would have got to court in 2016, they wouldn't have won, it would have soon been thrown out, or on appeal, it would have been lost because of that process wasn't done correctly. Been yet another setback for the grief-stricken family of Cheryl Grimmer. After waiting more than a year, the coroner says that she is powerless to call a second inquest into the toddler's death. Adding to the family's torment, the news arrived on the eve of Cheryl's birthday. At the plaque unveiled 50 years after her disappearance, today flowers and a birthday card, but for her family there's only fresh pain. To receive more bad news, um, yeah, time and just couldn't be worse. A Melbourne man was due to face trial in February last year over the murder of Cheryl Grimmer after she went missing from a Wollongong beach in 1970. You knew things about her only the, the killer could have known. But to September, Cheryl's family applied to have a second coronial inquest. Look at all the evidence. Why did they take another 13 months? Don't they think we've waited long enough, 50 years? But yesterday, on the eve of what would have been Cheryl's 54th birthday, this from the coroner. I have no power to order a fresh inquest. You don't have standing to make such an application. So Cheryl's father died in 2004 and her mum, Carol, died in 2014. They died without knowing anything about what happened to their child. Anything. And so really it's quite bad. But I want to come back now to Ricky. Now, Ricky Nash is what he's called now. Now, he is the brother, the seven-year-old brother at the time of Cheryl, uh, when she went missing in 1970. Now, um, his name now is Ricky Nash, and he found out that Vince, Cheryl's father, was not his, his father, so he wasn't the son of Vince. And so he's chosen to use his mother's maiden name as an adult. Now, he's revealed his parents could never move on, actually, from this disappearance and... Uh, I can understand that, you hear that from a lot of people, because they never had any answers. They never had her body. They, just, they couldn't put her to rest. You know, sometimes knowing is better than not knowing in these cases, because you're continually thinking, what could be? Could she be alive? Could someone be looking after her? Could someone be hurting her? The not knowing, you know, it's, it eats away at you, and I think it's what it done. He said that he can remember the beatings that he got, um, the hatred that my father had for me because he blamed me for leaving her, meaning Cheryl. Um, and he says, he's right, I shouldn't have left her. But my gosh, you know, this poor child the, the child that's still alive, that's living in this family, this knowledge of what's going on, and these other children in this household now are living in this household where the, where the oldest son is being blamed, you know, really, and beaten because he left the child for two minutes when he went and got the mum. Um... And he says himself that he, he's the one that really pushed to go to the beach. But you see, these things, and I think this is what's really sad about this case, not just that Cheryl's disappearance and the man that probably murdered her has walked free, but we are left here. This, this man, Ricky now, in his 50s, probably nearly 60, has walked around with guilt. And the guilt has been pushed on him, put upon him. No one's told him. This father didn't say to him. This father had brought him up for a good few years. He was very young when he met this child. It may not have been his father, but he brought him up as if. Now to beat someone and to blame someone, to blame a seven-year-old, it's really shocking. And I really hope that Ricky has got some help, some counselling, and that because Ricky is not to blame and I think if anything comes out this video he should understand he's not to blame the person to blame is the person that abducted a child a three-year-old from a beach in Wollongong on the 12th of January 1970 that's the person to blame I, I you know and this is the thing with guilt it can eat you up 
it can you know it can eat you away can't it but then to be reinforced this guilt by the parent by the stepfather you know to be beat for it to be reminded of it every day it's your fault it's your fault my gosh it's, it's I just felt I feel so sorry for Ricky Nash I really do and I really hope there is some conclusion to this case for Ricky really because it may give him some um, release from his guilt to find out what really happened here to his sister but also about these the brothers in this that continue to fight I think there is some issues with one of the brothers I know that I know that and I didn't want to bring that into this because this is about Cheryl Grimmer right so if you want to look at um, anything on the brothers or one of the brothers um, then I have left a link in the um, notes for you to look at or the references or I think it's on a slide actually now that I've put and you can see references to that but this case is about the disappearance of Cheryl Grimmer not really about the brother or anything else in relation to that but this is just about this so on the 12th of January 1970 um, you have this man and then you'll see him and they're trying to question him and stuff like that you know he's like 67 or whatever else he is now 69 um but i think why the police sort of went back for him was because when they went over this case was reopened they went over his um confession there was things in that confession that made them believe that he actually did kill this girl right now allegedly he's killed this girl right and then this also made the family believe that this is the person that done it. Now, because of this, you know, failings, I suppose, and it's, you can't really say it's failings, really, because it wasn't illegal at that time. Anything then police did with that interview in Australia to interview that lad without a lawyer or a parent or, you know, anyone else. It wasn't illegal at that point. So they did nothing wrong. But our investigation skills, and I also keep saying now, and DNA and things now have changed, haven't it? There's more evidence now that we can gather. But the problem is now, is because that he's now denying it. No matter how what he said then, if it can't be used, that means they can't use it ever. Ever. And so this man has walked free. The other thing I think we've got to think about with this man is, is I think it was over 15 or 17 at the time of this child's murder. Was he working on his own? Because you've got a person seeing him running off, you know, he's a kid. And I don't know if he was such a bright kid, to tell you the truth. I don't think he was. There was something, you know, about him. Was he working with others? Now, there are people that believe that there's more to this case than meets the eye. I actually agree with them. I don't know if he was working on his own. He may have had the you know, the guilt, and um, he wanted to go in and um, give a confession. But he'd, I don't know if he mentioned at that point anybody else or anything else. But, you know, you've got this boy that for some reason has gone in to give a confession to the police a year later. You've seen a white car in the area of the disappearance. They believe that someone in a white car took this child. Of a young lad you know I think you know we know there's a lot going on around there and we know there's you know we've said it before with a lot of paedophiles in these areas but do I think this boy done it on his own uh, probably not do I think people know something about Cheryl Grimmer and the disappearance of Cheryl Grimmer absolutely and I think this is why because um, the police, I think, now have released, um, or the, uh, uh, the government, sorry, have released now a, a million dollar reward for information to help get um, a conviction, really. Now, whether that's because they think that the person that they are trying to charge this murder was did have accomplices or is told someone or someone knows something and a million dollars, you know, is uh, a good way of getting information out of people, isn't it? It really is. But will they come forward? Or have we left this now too late? 
these people are getting old now getting old so it's only really going to be somebody I think that has real information about this case that thinks the money a million dollars is worth more than their loyalty to someone or some others or him I think that's what the police's aim is now to do to try and finalize this case for this family yeah it's a terrible case this it, it really is. It's a terrible case because this child's body's never been found. You've had parents now both pass away. All right, the father was a nightmare. You know, he was. But this is what grief does to you. This, this can change your whole personality when you lose a child like this and you don't get any answers. Is it justifiable that he beat his child and everything because he felt that the child was to blame? Um, you know... Um, no, no, does it happen? Yes, yes, you have been ripped apart inside and out. Your family, this lovely family that emigrated from the UK in 1968 to start this new life with all these hopes and dreams to have this new life in Australia, you know, within two years, your youngest child has been ripped from you. That's it. Minutes, she's gone. She's vanished. There is nothing else. So are the actions of the father justified? No. Are they understandable? Yeah. Yeah, because how much can you put on someone before they break? Did this family have counselling? They needed counselling. This man, this father, Vince, was in the Australian Army. He was in the army. To lose a child like this, the mother never got over it. The father never got over it. The kids never got over it. Ricky Nash never got over it. To this day, still has the guilt. But they have nothing to feel guilty about. Ricky has nothing to feel guilty about. And this is why this case needs to be solved. So if you have any information and you have an inform any information that may lead to a conviction, you would not only be one million dollars better off, but you would help sort this case out, finalise it, give this people that what's left of this family, give them a life back. That's what you would do. Now I have a lots of people in Australia that watch my videos, lots of them, spread this video out, See, something needs to be done because if it's not done this way and there's no evidence that's coming in the Attorney General said there is nothing that they can do this case will remain unsolved unless there is fresh evidence that now comes in this man is walking free and will remain free because there's nothing legally to say that this man abduct, abducted and murdered Cheryl Grimmer. So the onus is on the people that know something. There's always someone that knows something. So if you could and you, you know anything, please contact all the helplines that's there. I think the local police in Wollongong, there's lots of different places. There's lots of things about Cheryl Grimmer where you can access it. It would all be confidential and stuff. If you want the million pounds, a uh, million dollars, it wouldn't be confidential because you or evidence would need to be used so if you know something please say anyway this is the case of Cheryl Grimmer very very sad case thank you for watching thank you for um, joining me today and supporting Murder Analyze we really appreciate it as you can see I've done lots of slides um, for you to have a look at and all the sources that I've used are now on a slide and also all our social links are now on slides as well. So thank you very much. So until the next time, bye-bye.